afternoon, everyone. My name is Randy Hoyt. I am an owner and game producer at Foxtrot Games. Today we're going to be looking at tabletop games as cardboard interfaces. One thing they asked me to remind you is to fill out your uh, session survey uh, evaluation. After, you, after this talk, you should get that in email. Uh, they want to know how I do, and I want to know how I do, so please feel, please feel free to give us any feedback. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm the owner and game producer at Foxtrot Games. We're a small tabletop game company. We've put out six games so far with one more on the way. Four of those we've funded through Kickstarter campaigns. Three of those we've put straight to retail. Uh, our most recent game, Spy Club on Kickstarter, will be out this fall. Uh, this summer, we'll have it available in stores. In my day job, I am a user interface engineer, uh, software engineer. I've worked for marketing agencies and software companies, startups. One of the things we focus a lot on in our software interfaces is usability. As I've studied usability um, for decades now, I find a lot of the principles that you find in interfaces apply to tabletop games as well. They're of course not identical. There's not digital interfaces that perform functions behind on the back end, but both interfaces and tabletop game components and graphic design both interact with abstract underlying systems that humans, players, or users are interacting with. So a lot of the things in my work as a game producer, I find really studying usability and looking at the principles of usability really help improve the tabletop gaming experience. Uh, Jacob Nielsen, a usability expert, has broken down usability into five main attributes. We're going to be looking at these in tabletop games. There's learnability. How easy is it for a new player, a new user, to learn how to interact with an interface? How memorable is it? If they spend some time away and then come back, how easy is it for them to regain proficiency, to remember what they had learned the first time they interacted with it? Efficiency. Once they've used the system, once they've used the interface or played the game, how quickly can they perform the different tasks? Uh, if if something takes too long in uh, tabletop, we'll, you'll often hear the adjectives clunky or fiddly applied to it. It's just not as efficient to do the things that you know how to do already. Uh, accuracy, how often do users make mistakes? Um, and this is a big difference between tabletop and digital type experiences. If you're using an interface and you believe a button will do something when you click it, but you're wrong, when you click it, it will do the wrong thing. It'll do what it's been programmed to do. Uh, with a tabletop or analog experience, if you believe something costs less than it does, there's nothing that will enforce the real costs. If you move a knight in chess illegally, the game won't stop you. It won't give you an alarm or a bonk or you know, re redo your move. And if the other player doesn't know, you can just easily play games wrong. Uh, I follow a lot of board game players and designers on Twitter and you see all kinds of posts like, oh, I've been playing my favorite game wrong for five years. That just happens a lot. Uh, with tabletop because the game isn't uh, enforcing it. In fact, I hear many stories when people pick up a digital copy of a tabletop game, they finally learn, oh, that's how that worked. The last element is satisfaction. Now, with a user interface, you know, you think about if you're using software to file an expense report or book a flight or uh, like a message on Facebook, uh, you have a main utility of that app. You're trying to accomplish a task. And how you feel about it is sort of secondary. Obviously, if you enjoy your experience, you'll be more likely to come back, and it's an important part of usability. But with games especially, there isn't exactly a task that you're trying to complete. It's the satisfaction is the main utility. You are trying to have an experience. There are a lot of other goals, but really, are you having fun? Is it enjoyment? Uh, are you feeling skilled? Are you gaining mastery? Uh, is it uh, providing context for social interaction, all of those things relate very tightly to how you feel about the experience. So a lot of these things we're going to look at, usability, really drive that satisfaction that you have with the product, the game, and make you want to come back to it. So we'll look at a number of examples from games, some I've worked on, just because I have the behind the scenes insights on those, as well as some popular games that you're probably familiar with. And we'll look at these games in, uh, along these, some of these different aspects. So we'll start with a pretty popular game, Catan. Uh, Catan has three types of wooden pieces in the game, roads, settlements, and cities. One of the things you do on your turn is you spend resources to place one of these wooden pieces on the board. That's a pretty intuitive rule, and when you learn the game and someone's explaining it to you, uh, they say turn in resources, put the thing on the board. It's pretty intuitive how to do it. There are some rules, uh, some restrictions. Uh, but one of the things that's the hardest to remember or to learn is what exactly each thing costs. 
Uh, they've tried really hard with Catan to make them feel uh, thematic. Uh, so it makes it a little bit easier to remember. Uh, but when you come back to Catan after having not played it for a month, you might be a little confused. Now, what do I have to do to build a city exactly again? Uh, and also, these wooden pieces will generate resources. That's part of the game. You roll the dice, and if you're built on a corner with a number, it'll produce uh, that given thing, that given resource. Again, that's a rule that's pretty straightforward. Uh, but the costs, uh, to help with learnability and memorability, the game includes reference card. This reference card includes the building costs. It includes the victory points that you get for each one. So it's very common to easily remember the rules for how you build, uh, but not remember exactly what those costs are. So they provide this reference card. After you've played a few times, maybe you don't even need it, um, but it's there to help get players over that learnability and memorability issues. Another game that uses similar pieces, uh, Terra Mystica, it actually has three of the same pieces plus three others. Uh, these all have different costs. They have different benefits. The way that you uh, earn resources from your buildings in Terra Mystica is not as straightforward. Each one produces a different thing. Uh, in a way, the resources are easier here because there's only two. There's not five resources like in Catan. But then it makes it a little harder to remember thematically. So there's workers and coins. And it can be really hard to remember uh, what a trading post costs to build. Uh, and so a simple reference card probably wouldn't have been enough for Terra Mystica. So what they did is they give you this really large player board. And you place all of your wooden pieces on the player board. So right next to them, it shows the costs to build them. Uh, but the benefits that you get from building them are underneath the pieces. So when you put a piece out on the board, it reveals the benefit. Uh, so there's an income phase, and all you have to do is there's no table, there's no reference card. You don't have to count how many uh, trading posts you have out on the board. You just look at what you can see on your board that's visible. Uh, that helps a lot with the accuracy. If you had a table in the rule book and you had to count how many uh, temples and how many trading posts you had, you'd be more likely to make a mistake. Uh, so to help both with learnability, memorability, and with accuracy, uh, Terra Mystica comes with this player board. Also, each faction now can have slightly different costs and slightly different benefits uh, because every player gets their own board, and they do have some variability in them. Many modern tabletop games have cards in them, and cards have a few usability uh, issues or cons considerations. Uh, if you look at efficiency of playing cards. If you've got a hand of cards, being able to see uh, as much relevant information to that card while you hold them in your hand is really important for efficiency. Uh, playing cards didn't used to have the number and rank in the top left-hand corner. If you look like 150 years ago, you'd have to flip through all of your cards to sort of see which ones you had or fan them out really far. But here, a uh, hand of nine cards, you can see all the information that you need. Of course, in modern tabletop games, cards have a lot more information that you need on them. And so you really have to prioritize what goes in the top left corner, uh, what can go in different places. I've got a couple of different uh, games to look at here. Uh, seven Wonders, one of my favorite games. You start the game with a hand of seven cards, and you can, if you have the resources, you can build one, which is place it on the table in front of you. The building costs for these are all in the top left corner. So you can, even with a hand of seven cards, you can see all of the uh, requirements for you to build. You can quickly scan your hand and see, oh, well, I can't build those five. And at the beginning of the game, there are many you can't buy. So you can just focus on the two or three that you may be able to build. The benefits, um, what you get when you build them, is all in the top uh, up there. You can see a series of icons. So as you play them on the table, you can stack the cards uh, you don't have to have the whole thing visible. Uh, Seven Wonders does not have any card text, um, which is an interesting choice. The Ahab is a really robust system of iconography uh, that could be a little tricky to learn, but once you know it, it makes the gameplay a lot more efficient. You don't have to read all of the card text. Uh, just as an example, I taught my son, who at the time was seven, I think, to play Seven Wonders, and he could play it. It's not a game for seven-year-olds, but he could, I could teach him what all the icons meant, and he could learn, and holding them all in his hand, he could process what they were. We played some other games that had card text that were simpler, but he didn't read fast enough. He couldn't see them all at the same time, so he's flipping one card at a time, reading the text, and before he even got through his whole hand, he forgot what cards he had available. So having that iconography makes it really efficient. 
However, it does inhibit learnability to some degree. Here's one example card. This card, uh, what this iconography means is when you build this card, you gain two coins for every gray card you have in your civilization, plus at the end of the game, you gain two victory points for every gray card that you have. That's a nice long paragraph of text. Could have had that. That, you might not intuit that that's what that means from looking at it, but once you learn the game, that's something that you can then remember and process efficiently. They do include on the back of the rule book a giant list of all the icon references. Uh, just about every game I play of Seven Wonders in the Third Age, everyone picks up their hand and someone says, pass me the <laughs> reference book as a reminder. Now, another popular game, Dominion, uh, puts its building costs in a different place in the bottom left-hand corner. Now the reason for that is in, in Dominion, the cards start out on the table and you can see the costs to draft them into your deck. Once you get them into your deck, that cost is irrelevant. So when you draw the card and you hold them in your hand, you cannot see the building cost anymore. You're, it's like where your thumb is. It's hidden because it's no longer relevant. In the top corners, they show the, when you play a card, what it produces. Uh, they use some color coding to show what types of cards you have. Now the action cards, which are gray, you do have to read. Uh, you can see the name of those when you're holding them in your hand. Uh, and they are thematically tied to what they do. So the thief, unsurprisingly, lets you take cards that you wouldn't normally have access to. And so by driving home that theme, it can help you remember what they do. They do have another type of action card, which is a reaction, and those are coded in blue, so you can play those on other people's turns. Uh, again, just using color as a slight nod so you know when you're holding them in your hand and you can see that across the top. A uh, game that I've put out, uh, Fox in the Forest, it's a two-player trick-taking game. Uh, the cards do have numbers, uh, or ranks and suits, just like a typical uh, playing card, uh, but all of the odd cards have special powers, and those are all written on the, on the card themselves. The special power is tied to a fairy tale character that they represent. And so one of the things we found in playtesting was that we could really help the learnability, the memorability of the game by putting the name of the character at least in that top left corner. So all the 11s are monarchs and they all have a certain power. We included a reference card um, so that players can quickly reference what they do. Um, that's all pretty standard. We went a little step further and we commissioned an author to write us a custom fairy tale that really helped uh, kind of explain why the characters had that power. So the rule book, we kind of sprinkled these excerpts throughout. So uh, from this fairy tale, you can see why the 11 and the one, which is the monarch and the swan interact. Uh, just as a little way to help every little thing you can do to help a character or a player remember what does the 11 do? Why is the one related to it? Those kinds of things. And really, as you're playtesting, I strongly encourage you always to look at playtesting as usability testing as well. Of course, early on, you don't know if people are gonna enjoy the mechanics that you have, but as those mechanics start to get refined, as players are consistently having fun with the game, you can really start to take a look at the usability, how players interact. With Fox in the Forest, we asked players after they played, we'd quiz them a little bit, hey, what's the power on the three? Which character lets you change the trump suit? Uh, what number is the fox? And as we play tested that, especially once we put the character numbers in the top corner, uh, that definitely improved. And so we were able to get players by testing, testing them as well as the game to see where was it starting to become easy to learn, easy to remember what they're doing. Now just to give you some context uh, on the work I do as a game producer, if you're not familiar, uh, with the board game uh, process or how board games today get made. Typically what happens is a game designer will create a prototype and pitch it to a publisher. It's a bit like an author uh, submitting work to a publisher looking, the author will write a manuscript. Here the, the prototype will be fully playable, it will have been tested, been found to be fun. Uh, it will even have some clean graphic design, probably maybe some clip art or some stock photos to help set the atmosphere of the game. Uh, but I won't have any of that artwork done uh, yet. They'll pitch it to a publisher. Uh, that will come in and someone at the publishing company will take on the role of game producer, which is continue play testing, continue development. Uh, on the board game side, we have a little bit different terminology for designer and development than you might find in the video game world because a designer can, a game designer can 
make a complete, fun, functioning game without any special programming skills, any of that. So for development uh, at a publishing house, it was a bit like an editor in that book process. So the author will write the book, then they'll work with an editor to refine it. And at that, that point, uh, a developer is really helping uh, the, uh, the, the designer refine the game, play test it. And then of course you're looking at artwork and layout. So we'll commission the artist, uh, commission a graphic designer to kind of handle all that work and get it ready. And so when the game producer's work is done, what you have is a product design ready to go to the printer. Uh, it's usually a bunch of PDFs is the output of this process. Uh, at each step of the way, you're continually checking for usability. One of the biggest things I find in my work is a nice clean prototype has very good graphic design and when you start to add artwork and make it beautiful that starts to interfere a little bit with the usability and so there's a lot of work that has to be done. I've got some examples of that that I'll cover as we go. To dive in on some of the development, I'll start with uh, one of our games, World's Fair 1893. This is the prototype that was pitched to me. You can see there's some, you know, public domain paintings on there, some tokens with icons uh, from a site called GameIcons.net or The Noun Project. Uh, those are two popular places to find just simple, clean icons. And this was pitched to me. I evaluated it, played it, and decided I wanted to publish it. Uh, one of the mechanisms that we changed in the game was the scoring. So in the game there are five regions and it's, there's three rounds and you're going to be trying to get the majority in an area. You want to have the most influence in each of the areas. And at first the areas all scored with slightly different point values. So here, this one, the one on the left was five points for first, three points for second. The other one was four points for first, two points for second. And one of the things that the way that that, tracked, that scoring was tracked was with uh, generic scoring tokens variously denominated. So there I think were one, three, and five. So if you scored four points, you'd take a one and a three point token. Uh, there was a lot of back and forth making change. It was a bit too slow uh, for that scoring round. So we looked at adding a score track. We thought a game like Ticket to Ride has a scoring track and this is a similar weight. But an important thing to note with Ticket to Ride is you're not scoring 10 different things all at once in the middle of the game. You're scoring every time you build you score and then at the end there's a big scoring round. So as we play tested this, uh, continue to do usability testing, we found that in the scoring phases people would just start to check out a little bit and once one player starts to check out and everybody starts to check out then it takes longer to do the scoring <laughs> and it makes it seem longer. So the game was playing about 45 to 60 minutes. People really enjoyed it but you could just tell watching them that we needed to keep them more engaged. And so we looked at, I mean, this was more trouble than you might think to try to figure out the best way to track the scoring. So what we ended up doing was we changed all of the regions to be worth four and two. Then what we could do is just have a four point first place token and a two point second place token. It's much easier to just pass those out than it is to count out who's blue, let me count you four spaces on the scoring track, or even hand out just various, oh you need a three and a one, oh you've got ten, let me make change. So you can much more easily get through the scoring round. The game now plays in about 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, you know, and reviewers always talk about how great the game is for its decisions versus the time. And reviewers will always mention that. They'll be like, man, for a 30 minute game, this has a lot of decisions. And we found in playtesting that 45 to 60 minutes, it just wasn't quite delivering the satisfaction that we wanted. Another example of a fun component is from a game called Camel Up. Uh, if you've if you ever played this game, it's hilarious. You're watching a camel race. You're betting on this camel race. And the way the camels move is there's one die matching each color of the camel and they can move one, two, or three spaces each round. Each camel will move one space. Now to roll the dice, they have this pretty crazy pyramid contraption. It comes in the box as a piece of cardboard. You fold it up, wrap a rubber band around it, and it's got this little uh, trigger. So to roll a die, you flip it face up you push in the lever, pull it back, one die falls out, and then you lift it up and you reveal, oh, the white camel moves one space. Now I hear a lot of people all the time say, well, that's ridiculous, you didn't need this crazy pyramid, right? And that could be true, you could just put the dice in a bag and pull them out, pull one out and then roll it. But what's interesting there is that when you're rooting for a camel, you're like, I really need that blue camel to move two or three spaces, if they drew out a white die, you'd be like, oh, I don't care about the number on the white die. So you check out. Um, this way you reveal the color and the number at the same time. Keeps everyone engaged until it's revealed. There's no partial revealing of information. 
Again, silly, nice little touch, uh, but it does, it keeps the color and the number hidden until the exact same moment. One of the things in tabletop that we often do as publishers is re-theme games. I don't know how common that is in the video game. My understanding is that by the time you get into designing and developing, you're pretty much committed to your theme. But with tabletop games, the mechanics are abstract enough. Uh, there's a lot that we have to abstract away. Uh, you know, you play a card and that counts as building a resource or building a building. Um, and so publishers will at times re-theme games. Uh, this is one of our games that uh, I've rethemed. It was pitched to us as a flower-themed game. So you were planting flowers, harvesting flowers, and making bouquets. Nothing wrong with flower-themed games. There have been some that have done quite well, but it wasn't particularly interesting to me. But when I read the rules, I was really fascinated by the mechanics. And the way the game works is you place a tile, and all there's four colors all on the different sides. And whichever way you place it, um, everybody at the table will get a resource matching the color that's facing them. And I thought that sounded fascinating and wanted to play it. I uh, played it, loved it, uh, but wanted to look at rechanging the theme. So I made this themeless prototype. I used the paint shop, uh, or the Photoshop paint bucket tool to color out all the flowers and just make a solid color abstract version. And listen to what players, as they played, what they said about the game. So. They, the mechanics would give them these feelings, simple and elegant, it's calming, it's delightful, relaxing to play, and flowing. And I sat back and thought, what theme has all of those same attributes? Now, the mechanics in your game will produce an atmosphere, will produce a feeling uh, independent of the, of the theme. And a lot of times, people will feel a dissonance between the theme. If you have a cute theme but a heavy, aggressive uh, mechanics, players will just not quite feel right. So what I wanted to do with this was give it a theme that matched the feelings of the mechanics. At the time, I was talking to another, a number of other parents about why the movie Frozen had done so well compared to the movie Tangled, and I had, ah, that scene in Tangled with the lanterns in the water. I was like, that perfectly captures all of those feelings that the mechanics capture. And so we spent a good amount of time working on re-theming that game uh, to Lanterns the Harvest Festival. This is probably our most popular game right now. It's, uh, it was nominated for the, it was a finalist in the South by Southwest Tabletop Game of the Year uh, a few years ago. Uh, and we started working on the artwork for the game. As you can see, I kept some flowers in there as a nice homage to the original theme. Um, this is one of the, the artwork for this is one of those times where you're looking at the, the prototype was really usable, just solid colors. Um, but you want to try to then add artwork and make it beautiful. How do you still make it usable? So I worked with the artist here, Beth Sobel. She did a great job of sort of making sure that the, the design, the layout, would still be able to communicate to players what the, the gameplay was, which colors were on the sides. Uh, she made the different lanterns a different shape to help with colorblind friendliness and also just looking at it across the table. And they all have different arrangements as well. Um, you get a bonus in lanterns if you match two tiles of the same color side by side. And so she even made, if you do match them, they sort of complete a pattern. The, uh, if it's a white and a purple, it won't quite make the same nice symmetrical pattern as the white ones do when you match them together. I mentioned our most recent game, Spy Club. Uh, this is a game where you're playing, you know, neighborhood detectives solving neighborhood mysteries. And the prototype here the, uh, was very simple, very clean. Someone who did, has done graphic design for me uh, designed the game. So, of course, the graphic design of the prototype was very clean, uh, very solid colors. So you're looking across the table. What you're trying to do is get five yellow cards into the center to solve the object, five blue ones to solve the crime. Uh, and you can look across the table and see what colors everybody else has. Uh, we worried very much about, when we add artwork, how easy is it going to be to tell that they go together. Uh, so we worked with an artist and tried to figure out a way to make all of the objects look yellow, even though, you know, not with like a mask or something that made them look washed out. Before we commissioned all the artwork, we wanted to see if something like this was possible. Could we get photos that were sort of yellow-ish and see if they would work together? So what I did was I found a mobile wallpaper pack. Mobile wallpapers are more or less the same size as playing cards, or at least the same shape. And so I created a prototype like this. You can see the flashlight, the stamp, and the lipstick. They, of course, don't look anything like that, but those cards were all yellowish. And 
for the motives. I got cards that all were kind of reddish. The blue got cards that were all kind of bluish. Uh, and then we played this. Of course, I didn't play this with outside playtesters, only internal team members, because that's a little jarring when you have a prank <laughs> card and it's a mountain landscape. But we played with this a number of times to just see, before we commissioned thousands of dollars worth of artwork, if the, if the photos, which were different, but were still kind of bluish, if they would be able to be played and seen across the table. So in the end, uh, this is what the artwork looks like. So you can see the objects are all yellowish, the crimes are all bluish, the motives are all reddish. Uh, and it's worked really well. He did a great job making them all look natural. Uh, kind of the only comment we had is, why do all the people wear purple clothes in this town? Because the suspects are purple. So. That's always a challenge for us in just about every one of our games, is trying to make the art just as playable as the, uh, um, as the prototype. Uh, and sometimes we have to get pretty creative with that. Uh, so we're about out of time, so just to wrap up, I want to remind you of the five elements of usability. Learnability, how easy is it for people to learn for the first time? Memorability, how easy is it for people to remember once they've already learned it? Efficiency, how quickly can they perform the tasks once they know them? Accuracy, how likely or unlikely are they to make mistakes with errors? There's a lot to be said about rule books in there. Uh, I wish if I had another half hour we could talk about rule books and accuracy. Uh, and then satisfaction, how do people enjoy the game? I want to leave you with a few tips uh, as you're testing. So when you go into a play test, have very specific things that you're testing. You know, I mentioned we tested these weird photo versions of the Spy Club artwork. Um, there will be things that come up, of course, that you can't anticipate, and that's also a big part of testing. So write down every time a player makes an error, every time they ask a question. It's really easy when someone says, how much does this cost again, to just say, oh, three wood, and move on. But write that down, and if you start to see the same questions over and over, say, why do people always ask this? Is there something we can do to make them not ask it? Uh, is it not intuitive? Is it not obvious that a city would be three ore and two wheat? Will a reference card solve it? Uh, is there something we need to do to make it more thematic, more memorable? Uh, if you're a game designer, I highly recommend you watch people play other games. When you play test, you're going to be watching people play your game a lot. But if you've never just sat and watched people play other games, you won't quite know what you're observing. You know, you ask people, did you like the game? They say yes. You could say, well, we're done then. But if you've watched people play games that they love, you'll know if they're responding to your game like they respond to those games. It can feel a little weird and creepy to watch people play games, of course. Conventions are a great place to do it. If somebody's started a game, just walk up and say, hey, I've been wanting to learn this. Can I watch you play for a little while and see if I can learn it? And then that's not creepy. <laughs> uh, and also, I'd recommend you study interfaces in other games. So look at the graphic design in other games. Look at the way they use score tracks, uh, tokens, coins, all these things. This one can be really tricky. As I was preparing for this, I saw an article that criticized Dominion for putting the costs in the bottom left instead of the top left like other games, like Seven Wonders, or in, like Magic, which is in the top right. But of course, those are in very different contexts. Again, in Dominion, the card is already on the table, uh, and you can see it. It's not in your hand at this time. Again, we looked at World's Fair and a score track. We thought, well, other games use a score track, but again, that was a different context. So. I do recommend that you study all these games, uh, other interfaces and games, but be careful that your situation might be a little different and be very careful to pay attention to those nuances. That's all I have for now. We have time for probably one question, if there is one. Uh, I'll be in the overflow room for more questions after this, so uh, if anybody has one now or if we want to just wait till the overflow, that's fine.